Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The regimes of society are not like natural phenomena. They are frozen politics. The organization of society arises as the result of the temporary containment and relative interruption of our struggle, of our practical and visionary struggle over the terms of our access to one another. Social structures are simply frozen human activity that comes back to us as if it were an alien fate and acquires the mendacious semblance of naturalness, necessity, and authority. The true object of transformative thinking and transformative politics in the world is the mastery and the change of structure. Now, by that standard, there is today almost no progressive politics in the world. Today, the progressives appear on the stage of history as the humanizers of the inevitable. They have no program. Their program is the program of their conservative adversaries with a humanizing discount. Today, the right are supposedly those who accord priority to freedom, and the left, those who give priority to equality, within the framework of the established arrangements and assumptions. If we once again became willing to challenge and to change these assumptions and arrangements, we would understand that the true goal of the progressives must be now as it was in the 19th century, a larger life for the ordinary man and woman. And the struggle against entrenched inequality is subsidiary to that larger goal. If the goal is to lift ordinary people up to a higher plane of intensity, scope, and capability, the instrument for the prosecution of that goal is the cumulative transformation of the structure of society. Nothing is more important than structural change. Our ideals and our interests remain always nailed to the cross of the institutions and practices that represent them in fact. Underlying this idea, of the primacy of structural change is a metaphysical conception of our humanity. We are shaped by the context of society and of culture that we build and inhabit. Nevertheless, there is always more in us in each of us individually, as well as in all of us collectively, the human race, than there is or ever can be in them. They are finite with regard to us, and we are infinite with respect to them. We cannot fully respect one another unless we disrespect them. The complication is that in addition to being able to change the structures, we can also change, indeed we must change, the sense in which they are just there, beyond the scope of our power of revision. Society and culture may be so arranged as either to extend or to narrow the distance between the ordinary activities that we undertake within a framework that we take for granted and the exceptional activities by which, typically under the provocation of crisis, we change and challenge pieces of this framework. 
Our interest is to narrow this distance so that we can engage in a social world without surrendering to it. And this interest, this interest in our freedom, in our freedom to be insiders and outsiders at the same time, is intimately connected with our material interest in the development of our powers of production and our moral interest in the overcoming of entrenched schemes of social division and hierarchy. The liberals and socialists of the 19th century were inclined to believe that there was a pre-established harmony, a natural convergence between the advancement of our material interests in the development of our productive powers and our moral interests in human liberation. The truth is that there is always a zone of intersection between the arrangements that can promote our material interests and the arrangements that can favor our moral ones. An attribute of the institutions and practices to be developed in this zone of intersection is that they lend themselves to revision, that they be corrigible, that they allow us to engage without surrendering. The conception that the regimes of society are made and imagined was the central revolutionary insight in classical European social theory. This conception, however, as soon as it was enunciated, was also circumscribed and eviscerated by a series of necessitarian assumptions, of determinisms, of surrenders to fate and to faithfulness. The first of these assumptions was the idea that there is a closed list of alternative forms of social organization in history, like the modes of production in Marxism. And together with this idea goes the notion that there is an objective logic of group or class interests. Now, the truth is just the opposite. The more that conflict over the terms of social life escalates, the more it becomes clear that the question, what are my interests by virtue of belonging to a certain group or class, becomes inseparable from the question, what are the social alternatives? And who would I become under those alternatives? And what then would my interests be? The second necessitarian assumption was the idea that each of these systems was an indivisible whole. And from this idea, there followed a poisonous implication for the understanding of politics, namely that in politics we must choose between the revolutionary substitution of one system for another and the reformist management of an established system. On the contrary, the primary mode of transformative politics is radical reform, the piecemeal transformation of the structure that may nevertheless become radical in outcome if cumulatively pursued under a certain conception. The third necessitarian assumption was the idea that there are laws of historical change governing the succession of such systems in history. There are no such laws. If there were such laws, programmatic thinking, the imagination of the adjacent possible, would have no role. What then has happened in contemporary social science? The necessitarian assumptions have been rejected only because the structural idea with which they were associated has also been abandoned. Our task is therefore to rescue the radical conception lying at the center of classical European social theory from the incubus of the necessitarian illusion. In the absence of the execution of that task, what prevails across the whole field of the humanities and social sciences 
are rationalizing, humanizing, and escapist tendencies. In the hard social sciences, beginning with economics, the rationalization of the existent, a right-wing Hegelianism. In the normative disciplines of political philosophy and legal theory, a humanizing gloss on the established regimes, a pseudo-philosophical prop to the ameliorative practices of compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer and the idealization of law. And in the humanities, escapism. We embark on a roller coaster of subjective adventurism disconnected from the reimagination and the remaking of society. The votaries of these rationalizing, humanizing, and escapist tendencies profess to be enemies. In fact, they are allies in the disarmament of the transformative will and imagination. What kind of structural change do we then need? I answer this question in two impulses. First, from the top down and long term, and then from the bottom up and short term. From the top down and long term, the general conception of the direction. Here are three equivalent formulations. The first formulation is that we need structural change, but unlike the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, cannot bring ourselves to subscribe to a definitive institutional blueprint. How can we acquire the imagination of structural change without falling into structural dogmatism? Through a series of innovations designed to radicalize and generalize the experimentalist impulse in every domain of society and of culture. A second formulation is to understand the objective. The objective of the progressives, of the transformers. The objective is to raise the ordinary lives of ordinary people to a higher plane, to a greater scope, to a larger capability. And the instrument of this shared bigness is the cumulative structural transformation of society. To the contest between the market and the state, there succeeds a contest over the alternative institutional forms of the market economy, democratic politics, and independent civil society. The third formulation of this larger objective has to do with the relation that should be established between two competing goals for the progressives. One goal has to do with the defense of the majority against economic insecurity, with the historical fear of dispossession. But if this were the only goal of the progressives, the progressives would have no more than a defensive or negative agenda. The other set of interests to which they should be devoted has to do with energy, with creativity, with innovation. Whichever political force can most persuasively embody the cause of vitality commands the agenda of politics. And because the conservatives have more plausibly embodied this cause than their progressive opponents, it is they who now, for the most part in most of the world, command the agenda. If these two sets of interests are to be reconciled against the unchallenged background of social life, the structure, what we get is the Nordic model, or the third way, the hegemonic project of the North Atlantic elites today, to reconcile American-style economic flexibility with European-style social protection against the background of largely unchanged regimes of economic, political, and social life. If, however, we seek to reconcile these objectives, refusing to hold the institutional background constant, 
But on the contrary, subjecting it to challenge and revision, we get something entirely different. In the domain of economic life, we get a radically democratized market economy. A market economy that is not fastened to a single version of itself, but supports alternative regimes of private and social property. A market economy in which a much larger segment of the labor force gains access to the advanced sectors of production, to the revolutionary form of economic vanguardism, of production as innovation that is emerging in the world in the wake of the decline of traditional mass production. A market economy in which economically dependent wage labor will gradually give way to self-employment and cooperation as the superior forms of free labor. And a market economy in which no human being will be condemned to do the work that can be done by a machine. The purpose of the machine is to do everything that we have learned how to repeat so that our supreme resource, in a sense, our only resource, our time, can be preserved for the not yet repeatable. And in the domain of political life, what this goal entails is a high energy democracy, a democracy that raises the temperature and hastens the pace of politics, and that multiplies occasions for the creation of counter models of the future in different localities and sectors so that devolution becomes the complement rather than the contradiction of strong central direction. Such a high energy democracy is capable of mastering the structure, of undermining the power of the dead over the living, and of diminishing the dependence of change upon crisis. Now consider this question, what kind of structural change do we need? from the bottom up and from the short or medium term. The basic problems of the rich North Atlantic democracies can no longer be solved or even addressed within the limits of the social democratic compromise of the mid 20th century. Public goods like education and health make people. The state must provide a universal minimum at the floor of the provision of social services and operate at the ceiling, developing the costliest and most complicated services. But in the broad middle range between the floor and the ceiling, the state can and should engage, prepare, equip, and finance independent civil society so that it can participate not for profit in the experimental and competitive provision of public services as the best way of enhancing their quality and of provoking the independent organization of civil society outside the state. The second problem is the relation of finance to the real economy. Under the existing economic systems, production is largely self-financed on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. And the productive potential of the vast amount of capital accumulated in the banks and stock markets goes largely wasted. Finance can be a good servant, but it is a bad master. And we need a series of institutional changes and tax and regulatory changes that would enlist, mandatorily enlist finance in the service of the productive agenda of society. The third problem is the hierarchical segmentation of the economy. A new form of economic life emerges around the world. A vanguardism, of advanced experimentalism, confined, however, to sectors weakly linked to the rest of the national economy with the vast majority of the labor force excluded from them. And what we want is to disseminate these advanced practices. To achieve that goal, we must innovate in the arrangements 
that associate the state with small and medium-sized firms and that allow these small and medium-sized firms to associate with one another, cooperating and competing at the same time. The fourth problem is the practical basis of social solidarity. Money transfers organized by the state are not adequate as a basis for social solidarity, especially when the ethnic and cultural homogeneity of the society declines. The only adequate basis of social solidarity is direct responsibility to take care of other people beyond the boundaries of one's own family. And the fifth problem is that in the existing flawed and relative democracies, the low energy democracies that we have, change continues to depend upon crisis, historically in the form of war and ruin. What we want is change without crisis, and for that we need high energy democracies. Democracies that promote a high level of engagement, that resolve impasse quickly, and that combine democratic centralism with democratic devolution, that is to say, with counter models of the future. These changes that I have defended are designed to make transformation less dependent upon trauma. It seems, however, that they themselves require trauma to be established. Thus comes the role of the imagination. The task of the imagination is to do the work of crisis without crisis. None of these political proposals can advance in the world unless they resonate with our intimate anxieties. We all, as we grow older, risk succumbing to the marriage of the hardened version of the self, the character, with the compromises of our circumstance. A mummy begins to form around each of us. And within that mummy, we die many small deaths. To come more fully into the possession of our supreme good life, we must break out of that mummy. We must tear the mummy apart for the sake of life. These political proposals must draw meaning and authority from their association with this intimate concern. The political proposals are animated by an idea of vitality and communicate with the good of life presented to each of us. I can now answer the question, what kind of structural change do we need? I argue that this question has two answers. The first answer is we need the kind of structural change that can address the fundamental problems of the contemporary societies left unsolved and even unaddressed by the social democratic compromise of the past century. The second answer is that we need the kind of structural change that can enable us to be more human by becoming more godlike, which is to say more lifelike, so lifelike that each of us can die only once. What I found very interesting about the talk in particular was this contrast, if you like, this historical contrast um, between an awakening that happened in the 18th and 19th century and then a slumber. How did we end up in this slumber? And what is, forgive the phrase, a revolutionary class that will help us to awaken from that slumber? Democracies have been organized in the contemporary world in a way that leaves the structure, the theme of this talk, uh, unchallenged, yeah. except when the would-be transformers have wars and economic collapse as their allies. And so look at the fundamental rhythm of European life over the long 20th century. 
in their wars when they are slaughtering one another, the Europeans wake up. They wake up to the terrible devotions of war. Life seems to be bigger, and structural change ineluctably follows the conflict. Then in peace, they drown their sorrows in consumption and go back to sleep <laughs> under the instruction of philosophers, politicians, and entertainers who promote the poisonous doctrine that there are no alternatives in the world. Uh, and it is a, a form of political and spiritual servitude against which we must rebel. 